You're listening to Trek FM. Welcome to From There to Here, Trek FM's 50th anniversary Star Trek rewatch. We're going through all 729 Star Trek adventures from Enterprise to Star Trek Beyond and everything in between. I am Zach Moore, and today I am joined by Lee Hutchison. What's up, Lee? How's it going? Yeah, not too bad. It's an, another transatlantic Trek FM podcast. So <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to spending my Sunday evening in my pajamas talking Star Trek with you. Sunday evening, your pajamas, Sunday afternoon, and my Sunday best here in America. So <laughs> there we go. So we're talking about two episodes, as we always do. I'm from there to here. We're talking about one episode of Voyager, Alter Ego, and one episode of Deep Space Nine, The Begotten. We'll start with Alter Ego. And in this episode, Tuvok and Harry Kim become interested in a holodeck character who is more than she seems. So this episode, uh, Lee, what, what did you think, man? Um, I really don't like this episode at all. It's I remembered seeing it for the first time when it came on the air here in the UK on cable. And it was just so, so boring. Um, watching it again for the first time in years... I was like, oh man, I've made a huge mistake <laughs> picking this episode. It, there's some okay bits in it, maybe? I don't know, maybe I'm trying to convince myself there, but I just find the whole plot really boring. Harry Kim as um, wanting to become almost Vulcan because he's atta- emotionally attached to a hologram. Yeah, I can buy into his that behavior from him, but it makes it no less pathetic. Um <laughs> Tuvok taking an interest in someone yeah that's kind of cool but it doesn't really go anywhere and yeah it's it's just not a great episode I, I I have to agree with you uh this episode of Voyager is is it's like stereotypical Voyager right they they find a spatial anomaly and something goes wrong with the holodeck and it's just uh it's just all these cliches rolled into one here and uh, Harry Kim yeah I can buy him because he, he's unlucky in love, right? He's fallen in love with, with holograms and aliens and, 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 and dead crew members. And, you know, the list goes on. But Tuvok, yeah, I never, I honestly never thought he really got emotionally invested. Uh, I'm not really sure. I mean, I, I it took him way too long to mention his wife, though, in my opinion. <laughs> right? He didn't bring her up to the very end. For me, it wasn't really much of a big deal. That I think it was one of those ones that almost reminded you of like high school. That I th- watched this episode, and I never once, for any moment, thought Tuvok was romantically attached to this, right. like and romantically interested. You thought, yeah, he's just happy that there's a fellow intellectual, someone that likes to play Calto. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. And it's like, yeah, I can be friends with her. But then Harry Kim's like the teenage guy at the school, like, oh my god, he's in love with this girl. I'm so annoyed. And the amount of times that she gets brought up that oh, the, the hologram, she wants to speak to Tuvok, and there he is, like the puppy dog eyes. It's right. it's so pathetic. It it really is teenagers in space. Well, and then he can't even, like, focus on his job. There's several moments where Janeway gives an order, and he's just staring off into space, and it's like, come on, dude. Like, I mean, he's not... He What is he? Carrie Kim's got to be, what, like, in his late 20s? I mean, he has some sense of maturity. I mean, uh, I don't know. Just uh. People wonder why he's been an ensign for so long. <laughs> exactly. Uh, it turns out that this uh, this hologram is not actually a hologram. It's an alien who is basically catfishing the crew. <laughs> so it, what did you, you think know, of that? <laughs> it's, a, it's ahead of its time. It really, you know, they always say Star Trek it introduces us the, to the computers, the universal translator, flip phones. Also it introduces us to catfishing as well. So really just, you know, if there's something new that we've discovered on this episode that if people are listening to this thinking, oh, it's going to be alter ego, we don't like that. We've well, discovered Star Trek introduced catfishing. <laughs> Star Trek did it first, as always. <laughs> so, what what do you think of of um, Tim Russ as a Vulcan? I feel like I think about like eighty percent of the time he does a good job, but sometimes, like in this episode, like I didn't like, especially when he's like fighting the hologram characters. Like, like I mean, Leonard Nimoy invented the Vulcan neck pinch because he thought the Vulcans were intellectual and wouldn't like do hand to hand combat. And and I have to agree with him. There's something odd about seeing Tuvok like you know fight people like that. You know what I mean? 
Um, it would maybe be a bit more dramatic if he wasn't fighting a Hawaiian <laughs> d- uh, resort, you know, like the guy who pit makes the cocktails and the guy who puts the towels out. I, I mean, I kind of expect maybe a little bit more from Star Trek than that. Um, I, I think Tim Ross, Tim Ross is, is fine as a Vulcan. I just think he's really underserved with quality stories throughout the series that he gets some good moments really with Kess in the first few seasons and he's got the odd good episode here and there, but he's an unremarkable character and, and that's through no fault of Tim Russ's. I, I see that. I can see what you're saying there. Yeah, I mean, he probably is my second favorite Voyager character after the Doctor just because he, he has interesting stuff going on behind the surface because, he, I mean, he, you're right. He, the material as seen by this episode, you know, really isn't there for him. So he has to bring a lot more to the role uh, and, and make it his own. So, yeah, yeah. And you mentioned the Hawaiian resort. I, you know, watching back through these Voyager episodes, I, I forget like, okay, what, what is their holo- hologram, you know, uh, go-to place of the, of the season? Cause you know, they had the pool hall. They're going to have yeah. Fairhaven there. Now they're in the, does this place even have a, a proper name or is it just like the I, resort? I can't recall. I've lost my geek cred here. <laughs> Yeah, just an odd choice to, I don't know, I mean, a pool hall. I mean, they're, they're trying to be different, right? Next Generation, they play poker, and, you know, Deep Space Nine, they, they go to Vix, you know, in Vegas. But I, I don't know, much like many things about Voyager, they just couldn't, they just kept trying stuff, and nothing really stuck. It's, and then, and same goes for this holodeck program. But, yeah, I mean, there's really not much else to say about this episode, really. Um, uh, it's CGI just... looks all right when, the like, the nebula thing kind of sparks into life it looks pretty cool yeah, yeah th- there's that about it. <laughs> yeah for 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 late 90 cgi it was fine you know um and then i guess the moral of the story is look if you're lonely in your job and you need human interaction just get a new job that's what tuvok tells <laughs> what's yeah, her name exactly <laughs> it's a cry for health so so then voyager goes on the merry way and we never hear from this catfisher again well i'm sure we've sold people on revisiting this episode <laughs> Exactly. So we will move on as well uh, to uh, The Begotten, uh, our episode of Deep Space Nine today. In this episode, Odo receives a sick infant changeling from Quark and tries to teach it to shapeshift without resorting to the invasive techniques used by his old mentor, Dr. Mora. Meanwhile, Major Kira gives birth to the O'Brien's baby. Yeah, and I think it's an episode I really, really enjoy. I think René ebner does fantastically well in this episode that he... It must have been so challenging to perform against like some liquid detergent or whatever <laughs> they were using for the thing, like some Jello. It and he sells it so convincingly well that you totally one hundred percent buy into Odo's motivations, his interest, and his wanting to be a good parent to this blob. Essentially, it's it's a really wonderful performance, and I really think that um, when we get to see him and his mentor work together and they're working through a lot of their issues, it's it's some great Deep Space Nine character work. It's and it ties into the alternate um, from season three, I think that was, or season yeah, two. two. Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's a wonderful callback that Deep Space Nine is just so famous for. And even the you know the Kira storyline, it's very underplayed, but it's kind of quite funny. This idea that. Uh, Bajoran women need to be so relaxed to like have a child it's almost the total opposite to what we're used to here on earth so just that chiming of the the bell has been stuck in my head since the, the <laughs> late 90s even though the as you said that the cure plot it's kind of it's funny it's played for laughs sort of uh but the episode needed that because you know it has some levity and a very what turns out to be a very dark story with with Odo and it's it, you know you can translate it to to like the loss of a child really because Odo views this little changeling as a child and and he, you know, they're, they're trying to you know, teach it things and, and growing, and they start to communicate, they start to form connection, and then that's right when that starts to happen. Right when Odo is the happiest he might have ever been in his life at this point, uh, the child takes a turn for the ch- changing child takes a turn for the worse and, and dies. And when he's talking to it at the end, he's like, "You can't die. There, there's so much more I want to show you and teach you." Like, man, that really got me, you know, in the feels, man, as they say, <laughs> because that's oh, that's that's emotional stuff there. Absolutely, and I remembered watching it for the first time, and I never expected the episode to end with like Odo turning back into a shapeshifter. I kind of accepted by this stage that he was going to be a human probably for the rest of the run, that that was what they were going to go with. But it's it's kind of unexpected in a way that it just morphs with him. And then that moment when he realizes he's a shapeshifter again, and like you get the euphoria when he's like flying through the, the promenade. It, it's such an uplifting episode that, you know, he, he really benefits so much from the care that he gave the shapeshifter yeah because like dr morris says and he reached out to it he formed a connection so that was like its way of you know saying thank you in its own 
limited way and and i i did think it was interesting you know, when odo kind of takes off to via the hawk at the end uh he kind of leaves this, this puddle behind i guess that's what was left of his solid innards and organs that's kind of what i assumed it was probably so. it was probably his rack to Gino from the morning or something <laughs> like that it just like just came right out of his system because obviously they reject food and stuff so i assume it's something like that yeah. did you uh so you really thought he was never going to turn back into a changeling huh no I, I i said it on the broken link podcast at the time that i kind of thought he was going to be back to being a human again by the end of the next episode and with this I had been accepted that, oh, it's just, he's a human now, that's the story, and I never kind of watched this episode thinking, oh, I bet he's going to turn back into Shapeshifter at the end, it's going to be about, he's now human, and that Shapeshifter, he's going to be a bit jealous, and it was just a lovely surprise at the end that I went into this episode, like, no spoilers, or anything like that that would be commonplace these days, it was, it was a really unexpected, but pleasant moment to get. Yeah, and to me, it didn't really feel like a cheat because it made sense. You know, it made sense scientifically. I mean, he's, he's morphogenic. It makes sense that the changelings link with each other and, and he could absorb the other one into himself. And, and, and you know, I, I think of it like, if you ever watched the TV show Heroes? Yes. Uh, okay, so like Peter Petrelli, right? He was like the most powerful one of them all. And they took away his powers and they never really gave him all his powers back. And it felt like, what? Come on, man. That's such a cheat. And with Odo, it's a similar deal where he's he can do so many things. He's a shapeshifter, you know? And a lot I know a lot of people who criticize G Space Nine were like, you have this amazing character who can do all these things and, and he just walks around like a person the whole time. And yeah, okay, granted, but look, they're on a budget and you don't need to, him changing into things every episode. So that, that, that almost felt like a way to to take away that why doesn't odo just turn into this and solve the problem okay he's a human now we don't have that problem but uh, you know ultimately I, I i do feel like it was the right thing to do to give him his abilities back and that, that of course you know the then the last arc of these well the occupation arc of the station and of course the final chapter down the road him being a shape to replace so heavily into the galactic events you know so so this little episode here you know this this nice personal story has has great ramifications and we see as well with the Federation's interest in the shapeshifter baby as well that they're wanting these constant updates and like they're running out of time to like do their experiments with it like Odo's soft hand. The Federation are desperate to get their hands on it and you can imagine there's some sort of ulterior motives going on there with what we know now. It's not just the Federation are interested in this little baby they're probably wanting to maybe use it as a weapon of war, essentially. Right, exactly, exactly. And, and you know, you mentioned it earlier, uh, Lee, uh, Dr. Mora coming back was great because it's, you know, so many of these episodes, so many Star Trek, right? We meet these family members and mentors, they come in for an episode, never see them again, right? But it was great, and, you know, Dr. Mora's only in two episodes, but the fact that, that there was continuity there between, you know, season two and then here in season five, it's great. Like you said, Deep Space Nine, that's what it does best, and, 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 Again, you, you get some real emotion between those two characters. You understand where Odo's coming from, and you understand where Doctor Moore is coming from. And neither, neither of them, you know, uh, meant ill toward each other, but they just, you know, they just had a, a gulf of misunderstanding. And and then they they come to like kind of reconciliation at the end. And it dovetails in with Kira because she feels like she lost a child. She was carrying O'Brien's baby this whole time, and then she had it, and now she you know, misses it. It was part of her, and it's gone. And Odo has lost a child, so they go for a walk at the end. It's just a very nice way to to tie it all together at the end. I think. It's just a lovely little character piece, the cam before the storm, in a way. <laughs> exactly. Well, Lee, those are, uh, I think we've said all we can about those two episodes today on From There to Here. If people want to find you on the internet, where can they find you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Lee underscore Nostromo or at Star Trek VHS, where I talk about Star Trek VHS of the 90s and 2000s and everything in between. Um, there's a, and I'm sure there's a niche market in there. No, I follow your Twitter, uh, the VHS Twitter. It's very interesting to see these old artworks and stuff. Like, what, you know, it, before the years of Photoshop, they did some interesting things. <laughs> with no one's ever they... requested Alter Ego. I'm, I'm going to have to say that for the record. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, as for me, uh, you can find me here on the network every week talking about the original series on Standard Orbit, our original series podcast. Uh, personally, you can find me on Twitter at MoronZach. That's M O O R E O N Z A C H. And I'm also the host of my own podcast, Always Hold On to Smallville, where we talk about each and every episode of that young Superman show. Well, that does it for us today. Lee and I will be back tomorrow to talk about two more episodes of Star Trek. 